The passing of the 1930 Natives Land Act marked the formal dispossession of land in South Africa. Sol Plaiki, founder of the then African Natives Congress, unsuccessfully challenged the British government to scrap the legislation a year after the act became law. When apartheid was enacted in 1948, land dispossession continued. Residents of District 6 in Cape Town were some of the casualties of forced removals. On 11 February 1966, District 6 was declared a white group area. And that essentially meant that people, District 6 was declared white and all black people had to leave the city. About 60 odd thousand people were forced to leave. What you see behind me is really the images that people from District 6 took as the area was being demolished. So it's images of young high school students who would go to school and on the way would take photographs of the buildings that would be demolished around them. What do you call this? So we call this a memory box. Um, it really depicts the stories of people who lived in District 6. And the two stories you see depicted in these boxes belong to Yasmina Saleh and Farinaz Gilfalian, both who lived and grew up in District 6. The museum works with people's memories. They share how life was like in District 6 and why it was important to them. And a memory box is just a way of capturing all that information. This is the house of Zubeda Hendricks, a 100-year-old District 6 beneficiary under government's restitution program. Her daughter Zahra says her mother almost gave up after struggling for many years to claim back what was dispossessed from her. She had to take up the fight for her mother. Practically every week I was at the land claims office to come and inquire about her claim. And she was uh, given the key in 2013 and then she was very very happy to move back to district 6 that was her wish to come back to district 6 she is today 100 years old next month she will be 101 and she is still in district 6 she is actually the oldest community member in the area Zahra, who is also chairing the District 6 committee, says the slow progress in the resettling many of the claimants remains a concern. The process is very, very slow. There is still 975 units that National needs to build for the early claimants. Then the District 6 Working Committee has 3,000 late claimants. The District 6 Working Committee took government to court because of the slow process and we won the court case and that is why there is progress now of claimants moving back to District 6. For some of the youth of District 6, they want to see more resettling and reintegration in the area. Possibly to let all of the original, or not the original, but the people who lived in District 6 before, the pre previous people who lived here, in the old District 6 before they bulldozed it. So I would like to see that people coming back to live here again and to claim their land. They could at least like make a change because like as you can see over there on that side behind the mosque there's a squatter camp and there's a squatter camp over there. So if they can at least like just give the people like proper houses instead of putting tents up in it because I don't like seeing people like that. For me it's it's how can I say it's heartbreaking to see people like it because no one deserves to live like it like everyone deserves to be treated equally from district 6 to Suez were informal settlement near Danun along the N7 here people just want to get a proper piece of land and decent housing it's not healthy to be honest because I think this land is not enough because these were graves, but we are building houses here because we've got no place to stay. We don't have money for rent. So this area is just, just sucks. It's not good for our people. We've got kids and there is a farm here, but even people are staying here in this area. So it's, it's not right at all. If we can stand in unity and if we can stand as one, I'm definitely sure that we will be able to bring the land back to where it should be. How will that be done? Um, firstly, government. Secondly, is making the correct decisions. And thirdly, the biggest problem we have, and we all know it, is corruption. As they say, this is an informal segment. We just want the temporal housing here. 
so that we can stay at a safe place. Even our children, when they when they are about to go to school, they can't because it's raining. The transport can't go in when it's raining to take the children to school. The transport won't come in because it's raining. As you see, there are the dams all over, so the road is not good at all. Although Zwezwe is a wetland area not suitable for habitation and without water and sanitation, some of its residents have become creative. This is Zuko Kalipa preparing this rubbish dump section to use for food security. I try here to make leaven for cotton. I'm going to plant spinach and onion and other stuff. I'm going to take the stuff, onion, to support the people here. We have Chris here. Yes, yes, yes. But that is rubbish that you have to do, so you're creating, uh, because that is rubbish that, you, that is there, are you now creating a land to, to plant? Yes, but I have compost, you see there, you see there, it's a compost. After I finish to making leaven, I'm going to put compost, also sand. So when do you think you're going to start uh, uh, planting? I'm going to start this month, because you're supposed to make leaven there. I'm going to start in this month. The Land and Accountability Research Center at the University of Cape Town reflects on the lack of progress in addressing the land question 110 years later and in a democracy. So looking back, I think the progress has unfortunately been quite slow, especially in the last 30 years. Despite the constitutional commitment to land reform and the fact that a land reform program is laid out in the constitution, it consists of three steps. One is to secure the tenure of people. One is to redistribute the land, which is about changing the nature of ownership and who holds land in South Africa. And the third part, of course, is restitution, which is returning land to people who are dispossessed. All three of those programs have really struggled to make an impact in changing the scape, the landscape, the picture uh, of land ownership and the strength of land rights in South Africa. Some of those who are the hardest hit by the slow progress of land reform and restitution are in the former homelands. For communities in the former homelands, it's been a particularly slow process because they've had to work harder because customary law, of course, also has to try and catch up with a common law system that has been the dominant format and framework for land rights for you know hundreds of years. And so even though we are not in the same position as we were when the 1913 Land Act was passed, I would say that despite 100 years uh, having passed, progress has been very slow. The debate on land ownership continues to be a thorny issue for some. The PAC is one of the parties that has been at the forefront of the land debate. It says land ownership remains skewed since colonialism, and this has not changed. 110 years, 13 years, whatever, we are still where we were in 1913 or 1652. 29 years in the so-called democracy, it is worse. We are still, I don't even think we are still holding it unto 13%. I think we are at 8% now. Every land has been taken by white people. Even our own government could not just address the land question. So there is nothing about 1913 that has changed. The land still remains in the hands of the white people. But another party, the FF Plus, has always disputed the patterns of land ownership in South Africa. The statement to say 87% of land uh, was owned by whites is not correct. We must, the moment we talk about hectares, we must realize, if you go for instance to the Karoo, if you have a farm there less than 10,000 hectares, you cannot farm, you can't do anything with the land, it's not productive. So that is not a correct way to see land reform. In fact, uh, there is a statistics that is actually shown that if you take urban land and you include it, then you will find that about between 66 and 70 percent of land is actually occupied by black people. But yes, the government doesn't want to give them title deeds. So that's the problem. As the debate over the legacy of the Land Act rages on, the UDM has rejected the expropriation bill for not making provision for the restoration of land stolen before 1913. 
land dispossession in South Africa did not start in 1913. It started way back. You will recall that all the chiefs in our country, in all the different provinces, fought against land dispossession. And some of the people were removed from their own land during those periods, long before 1913. We did say, even during that committee, that, uh, that dealt with the, ex with the expropriations committee, that it did not go back far enough. And because of that reason, we didn't support any initiatives that came out. It, it's almost like he wanted to cater for those who were removed starting from 1913 to date. All the chiefs fought against land dispossession in the country. You have to check even in the Eastern Cape alone when you're talking about the frontier wars, the wars against land dispossession, which lasted for 100 years. Can the land question be addressed 110 years later? And how can this be done by government? They don't have political will to address the land question. They are invertebrates, they are cowards. They can't address the land question. Even when they tabled the so-called land expropriation bill with or without compensation, we, we said it, that it was just a political gimmick. They were not going to address it in their own bill. They were not going, they knew it was not going to succeed. Most of their members were not even in parliament on that day because they don't take land question seriously. Why? They are scared of their handlers. They are scared of the Western world. They are scared of the white people. They can't address it. Yes, from the PAC side, the land must be repossessed. The view of the Freedom Front Plus when it comes to land reform, we firstly say we must go and look at state-owned land. And if you want to re redistribute, use those land and then you redistribute it. Secondly, we said very clearly that the civil servants of the Department of Land Reform must be competent people and they must ensure that the corruption uh, in that process of land reform must be removed because there is quite a lot of corruption when it comes to land reform. Thirdly, we also say that we believe in the principle of the fact that people should freely uh, avail their uh, land for land reform. And that will be able to give people the opportunity to farm with a mentor, for instance, to ensure that they develop the skills to be a farmer. When the deputy president recently faced oral questions in the NCOP, he acknowledged that the land question remains a thorny issue. I did indicate uh, <clears throat> the last time I spoke, I can't remember what it was in this house, that we have accepted ourselves as the governing party that uh, land reform has been slow. Uh, but I don't think we should give an impression that nothing has happened. If you look at uh, uh, the figures out there, I won't quote most of them, but for instance, a total of 552,000 households have benefited from land reform programs, with 174,000 being female-headed households, 1,240 households headed by people with disabilities. 700,000 hectares of state land has been identified and distributed uh, as earliest as uh, 2020. So there is a lot, honorable member, uh, that is happening. But you'll recall as well that as we involved, get involved in, in land reform, redistribution and restitution, we are also doing transformation. Mashatile says some of the hiccups in land restitution are caused by various factors. One of the challenges is sometimes because of disputes uh, from land claimants uh, within families or sometimes even, even communities don't, who don't just agree uh, on the use of land on, or who belong to that uh, particular area. And those tend to delay. Uh, the program of land reform to ensure that uh, people get back their land through redistribution or re restitution. But we are, we are addressing that. I think it is in our interest to ensure that uh, 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 people do access land uh, 
as, as quickly as is possible. Meanwhile, the Land and Accountability Research Center believes that policy implementation and the resources are key to fast-tracking and addressing the land question moving forward. What we really need, Mercedes, is some creative thinking around law and policy. We really need the government to put effort, finances, resources and manpower behind developing laws that can provide adequate protection for people. Uh, when it comes to customary land rights, we do have a law in place that's called the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act, EPILRA. If the state were, for example, to work on making that a permanent piece of legislation with re uh, regulations that could support its implementation, that could make a massive impact. The Department uh, of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development is massively under resourced and so it would be a big uh, vote of confidence if the state were to make sure that that department was well resourced so that it could take up the job that it needs to and we need to make sure that the laws that protect farm workers from evictions are being followed and implemented so really we need a bit of state might um, you know we need them to put their money where their mouths are and as the legacy of the 1930 Natives Land Act continues, even 110 years later, the infamous law which has been repealed remains in this section of the Library of Parliament in the NCOP building. Mercedes Besant, SABC News, Parliament.